Hello, everybody. This is Amy, Vice President of Conservation at Oakland Zoo. What a joy it is to share this world with wildlife and a challenge. But there's hope when we get together like this, when we meet heroes, when we have you all here watching and participating. I feel a lot of hope, a lot of hope for the future. We're so glad you're joining us for this very last virtual rendition of Cocktails and Conservation. You're watching Cocktails and Conservation, where we rendezvous with inspiring wildlife conservation leaders from around the planet, hear their stories, learn how they protect the animals we love, and how each of us can help them. With our featured custom cocktail, together we toast to Taking Action for Wildlife. All right, you've landed at Cocktails and Conservation, where we meet wildlife heroes from around the world. We listen to their stories, we join their solutions, and we have a refreshing beverage with people like you who'd like to take action for wildlife. Tonight, we're celebrating 100 years of Oakland Zoo. It is our centennial. So we're trying to make it extra special by showcasing that we've rescued over 100 animals over the years. Um, and we're kind of celebrating with you all. This is also the last that we're doing virtually because we can get together live again safely. So we're looking forward to doing that. If you'd like to mix up your Thai or tonic, um, there's going to be a recipe there in there in the comments. Um, all right, I'm going to start by introducing an animal that I've loved for many years, and I'm not the only one. Where is she? This is Jenny, the um, sulfur-crested cockatoo from Australia. Jenny has been at the zoo for 35 years. She was confiscated, she comes from the illegal wildlife trade, and she's one of the many rescues we have at the zoo. And what I love is Jenny is so loved, so pampered. She's such a diva, because she's so well taken care of. She's got trainers and nutritionists all giving her the best life possible, but she also educates. So she has probably taught hundreds, if not thousands of people to make a really good choice when you choose a bird as a pet and to make sure that's a rescue, it's a reputable source, um, and you're not adding to the illegal wildlife trade. So thank you to Jenny. Maybe we're dedicating this show to her, Jenny the bird. So when you walk, um, oh, well, let's just start by welcoming you. Welcome if you're tuning in on Facebook, YouTube, maybe you're a friend of PETA or the Department of Fish and Wildlife, or you're just someone who loves animals, especially if you're someone who rescues animals, kind of like me and maybe a lot of you, dog who's running loose, a bird who's not doing well, maybe you're just moving a spider out of your house. Are you a rescuer? If so, come on, tell your story. What was your latest rescue? Go ahead and let us know. We love to hear these little stories or big stories. All right. So also, if you've enjoyed these cocktails and conservation events, go ahead. Um, there'll be a link there to go watch. This is the 18th episode. You can watch all the old episodes. And if you'd like, join us live. We've got two more episodes um, or events going on, one on September 28th at the Sailboat House um, on Lake Merritt, Oakland, all about herons, and October 21st, all about gray wolves at the Oakland Zoo. And that information is on our website or in the comments. All right. So maybe you've walked through the zoo and you're looking at all the different animals and one might wonder, where do these animals come from? There's so many different kinds. There's from all over the world. Um, how do you get them? Well, Oakland Zoo, like a few, a lot of other zoos, I like to say, a lot of them are rescues. We're giving them a forever home because they've got some sort of crazy story. So maybe they were a legal pet you know, like a macaw that could no longer live with these people. You know, maybe they outlived them or they're just too difficult to take care of. Um, maybe there were a wild native animal um, that became a nuisance, um, like a river otter, alligator, sometimes have to leave the wild and find their way um, into our doors. Um, maybe they can't stay because they become habituated to humans, um, like the bear was fed um, or something like that and they have to either be put down or or come live with us um, maybe they were found as orphans they're too young malnutrition they're hurt they can't survive on their own like our mountain lions and then they live with us or 
Worst case scenario, they were used as entertainment, um, cub petting, photos, whatever the case may be. And luckily they were confiscated and now we give them forever home. Like there's so many stories. So we want to just say thanks to those that actually choose to surrender an animal that they don't feel like is a, a is a good idea any longer. Thank you to those people. And thanks to those who may have turned in some of those people um, so that animal can have a life with us. Um, we love it. And thanks to stories, um, old stories from Oakland Zoo Beginnings from the Snow family and Nancy Clark, who told us that when we opened the doors of Oakland Zoo 100 years ago, all kinds of people gave us their pets. Um, they had some inappropriate pets and we took them in and gave them a good life. And I've been at the Oakland Zoo, not 100 years, but 20, and I've got to witness some pretty cool stories. So if you recognize these animals and stories, just let us know in the comments. Now, this is in 1999, um, a circus shut down um, that was out of a different state, but when they were coming through Oakland, they knew they were being shut down and they wanted a home for their tigers. And Oakland took them. So these animals that were circus animals, um and lived in cages like that for years got to come live with us this is Toriko, suma and maya and this is 1999 and we gave them a wonderful life and enclosure and really inspiration to teach people hey don't go see wild animals and performances we can make better decisions and come on it's the bay area there's so many performances all right you might know beautiful leonard and sandy these guys came from Texas. This was through working with the Houston SPCA. And they were found, I believe, in somebody's basement guarding drugs, along with a lot of other animals. We got them as little cubs, took them in, um, and really tried, um, you know, try to teach people to go ahead and, and support these animals and beautiful lions around the world in Africa. So they had a great home and they were great educators. Um, and then here is just two of our four beautiful tigers we had for a while, Molly, Malou, Ginger, and Grace. And they also came from, <laughs> I think, Texas. Sorry, Texas. Um, and these were somebody's pets um, used to make money, probably for photos. When they couldn't take care of them anymore, they turned them over to a zoo in Texas and they didn't see the light of day. They had to live inside because there was already too many other rescued tigers at this facility for them to have outside space. When they came to us, it was their first time outside in a year. So these are some of the stories. Um, we've taken in pet macaws, um, we've taken in fennec foxes, all kinds of animals, in fact, Here's my list given by Jenny Green at Oakland Zoo. It is long of all the animals we've taken in and I am so, so, so proud of that. But we couldn't do it without partners. We don't do it alone. Um, we've partnered with the Humane Society. We've partnered with PAWS. We've partnered with ADI. And we've partnered with the Fish and Wild Department of Fish and Wildlife, US Department of Fish and Wildlife, and even PETA. And these are some of our wonderful guests tonight. All right, so our guest comes from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Now, what do they do? Well, they manage and protect the state's wildlife, the wildflowers, the trees, the mushrooms, the algae, the kelp, and native habitats. And they safeguard our wild animals by implementing laws, making it illegal for exotics to be pets. Um, they really do work tirelessly to ensure we live in harmony with California's wildlife. Um, what they do is incredible. They're vets, they're human wildlife, eco living together team, they're wardens, and even their PR people just want us to coexist and they're really committed to that vision. And for many years, Oakland Zoo has had a very special partner within that department and that is Warden Will O'Brien. He's been amazing. He's come and taught kids for years at our Earth Day events and has been on the scene um, when there's a puma in need. Um, he's just a special friend and I am so glad to show, um, show him off to all of you. So we're going to welcome Warden O'Brien. Will. Hi, Amy. Hi. How's your day going? <laughs> Fantastic. Good. How's your day going? So far, so good. All right. Well, we are so excited to have you here. You've just been a voice for 
all you do and all of California wildlife for many years for the Oakland Zoo. So I'll just start by saying thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me. Okay. And you know, it's kind of a mystery to some people what's going on in that world. And there's so many different positions. So we'll just, we have you. So let's start with you. Um, how did you get this job? Like what's been your path to this super cool job? And then we're going to hear more about what you do in that job. You know, I owned a security company along with a few other guys in San Francisco. And I, I wasn't enjoying that very much and had actually wanted to get involved with firefighting and went to a firefighter's academy, but I couldn't find employment. And so I decided, well, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good with, with law enforcement kind of things. So I started going out for law enforcement jobs and did a lot better. And Fish and Wildlife, they, they, uh, they gave me a job. You know, when I saw the ad for it, I, it reminded me of how I grew up. You know, they're very rural and there was a lot of hunting and fishing going on and I had just never thought of it. And then there it was in front of me and I went for it and they, they, they hired me. All right. And then, um, okay. So, so you had a, you had a path and you got to where you are, but you just seem perfect for your job and you do a lot of things. So I'm just going to show this one picture and be like, well, what are you doing there? <laughs> what does that describe about your work? That is the when Dungeness crab is in season commercially. And so th these boats just bring them in. I mean, by the ton, literally by the ton. And what we do is as they're offloading them into what's called a receiver, which is just another word for a market, um, we'll start measuring them. That's what I'm holding in my left hand there. And uh, if, if too many of them are small, they're allowed to have 1% can be undersized and they can't take any females. So if we start hitting, you know, 3%, 10%, 13%, on this particular one, it was like 15%, then we start having them give us one tote after another. And when the whole load's off, if what we've counted is more than 1%, we can cite or seize the load or, you know, whatever feels appropriate. So, so, that's you, so you guys are literally taking the law, whether it has to do with any kind of animal or plant, fish, mm -hmm. shark. Um, and making sure people are sticking by the law. So like, what's another day in the life? You know, most of my days have to, I, I'm just on patrol and I'm checking people who are fishing, you know, or I'm in markets looking at what fish they're bringing in and I'm backtracking them. And it, 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 it sounds more mundane than it is, but there are certain days where usually it's because we get a call from a citizen. A citizen sees something that is just not right and goes ahead and calls us. And some of them, they'll, it'll be in their voice. You know, I'm not sure if this is, and then suddenly you're, you're working on like a case of the century. It, it, so we had, I want to hear more, but mm -hmm. one of the questions we had from the audience um, mm -hmm. was, well, what's a wild story? What's one of the craziest calls you've gotten or things you've done? Because maybe there's mundane-ish days, but there's mm -hmm. got to be crazy stuff. Oh, there it's are. California. There are actually days where I look back on now, like from early in my career, where I'd go, I would never do that again. So, <laughs> you know, people have asked me this before. What is my wildest story? And um, the, the wildest story that I have, and it's the same one all the time, this man committed suicide in his apartment. Oh, geez. And when the EMTs arrived, one of the EMTs, this is what I, I heard from the officer, the police officer who was there noticed that the guy had a lot of terrariums in his living room and that all the lids were off. And oh so, yeah, he starts looking around. I, I, I don't think he saw anything. They get the body out. They call us and we show up and, you know, well, this is wildlife and this is what we're supposed to do. And next thing you know, we're pulling rattlesnakes and cobras and uh, he had a, a black mamba in there and a, a few other things. It's hard to remember now. This was 14 years ago. And um, we went around. Now, they were fairly socialized. None of them were aggressive with us or anything. It was fairly cold. And I think that probably kept the tropical ones wow. kind of he, subdued. So he opened all the containers. He opened them all like he was going to set them free. But it was just in his apartment. I, you know, with people, it's, just, it's hard to tell. People will act out of character or do something that's in character that's just mm -hmm. odd all the time. Wow. Well, you know what? There's calls like that, but 
I know that you've gone out on calls that have really meant life or death for an animal and oh, yeah. and you've you've been there for those animals and I'm sure not all of them were safe rescues. Mm -mm. Um so we've um we've done a lot together. We have. So if I were to say to you, what's been your relationship with Oakland Zoo? What it has been doing? phenomenal. <laughs> Oakland Zoo has been a godsend to my department. There's no doubt about it. You know, it started off with with Earth Day. I was working with US Fish and Wildlife and they had already had, they already like reserved a booth with you guys. And they asked me if I wanted to come along and I said, sure. So they made sure it was okay and it made our booth a little bit bigger and we all brought things and we talked to people about what we did and what was on the table and stuff like that. And you came along and we were talking and chatting and um, you thought that was interesting. Now I can't remember if we decided we'd do a ride along then and there or if it was maybe a couple of conversations later, but you came on a ride along with me. I did and, and we that, were investigating turtles and all kinds yeah. of things. Oh yeah. And, um, I think that, uh, you know, we just, the whole time we're talking and so it just kind of sprung up. So once that relationship was made, when it came time where we really needed the Oakland zoo, such as with the mountain lions, it was a very easy channel. As a matter of fact, that was a channel that you opened. You got in touch with us after that situation in, mm -hmm. in, um, Pacifica and, 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 and I've told you this in person, but I'm going to tell you this in front of everybody else that you were the only organization where you said, what can we do to help? You didn't say what happened, why'd you guys do this? You're horrible, whatever. You said, what can we do to help? And that was just such a breath of fresh air. And so you and I talked and kind of got the ball rolling. And then it, it became a, a, um, a program that required someone of higher rank than me. So um, I believe it was Captain uh, Risky mm -hmm. took over on that. But it's been great. It is so nice to know that when we get one of those mountain lions, that we have somewhere to take it. Uh, that, that, well, that was the situation for a long time. It really shows. I just so appreciate you saying that. And it was, and it was because we had a good relationship that we were able to have hard conversations at the time. Yep. But it really, um, saving animals really depends on people and organizations having good relationships, which is a little okay. bit of our message tonight. Very cool. Um, and so let's tell those stories. I mean, this is Rose. I don't remember if you were involved with that one, but I will mm -hmm. speak for you and say, you know, it is, it's the Department of Fish and Wildlife and people like William who, you know, maybe you can tell us a different mountain lion story, but go out and scoop up these babies in so many different ways so I, we can get them and help. I, them. I don't know for sure, but um, there were two mountain lion cubs right about that age, a male and a female, and they were running around down in Pacifica and uh, a warden who's not with us anymore named Nick Fitzgerald and I, and we had a uh, uh, Terrace Castine, who's a biologist, all went out there and we managed to net them. Um, Nick actually netted both of them and I just assisted, but then we uh, wrapped them up in, in some, some travel cages that I had and we brought them up and the male was in really bad shape. He had a torn up nose and the female was a little bigger and she was a little healthier, if, if, if I remember right. Yeah, I, re I think I remember those. And you know, we're up to almost mountain lion 20, thanks to that relationship. Wow. The lions that we've gotten, been able to take care of, um, either keep, which I will show, because um, we love our three, um, or find homes for them. So um, thanks for thanks for that. And and in your mind, why are mountain lion young mountain lions needing this kind of help? Well, so what I say might be controversial. I'm not sure. I'll try to put this, you know, nicely. But the laws surrounding mountain lions has allowed their population to explode over mm -hmm. you know, explode. Maybe maybe not be right, but to 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 really climax over the past you know, 10, 15 years, 20 years. And um, what happens is these, these young males, it's always males, except for, that, except for Rose or that one female, all the rest I've been involved with have all been males. And they just get pushed out by the bigger males. You know, they reach a certain, certain time in their maturity. They're not with mom anymore. And so they get booted off San Bruno Mountain or whatever. And the next thing you know, they're down at the ballpark in downtown San Francisco, not knowing what to do. And then we, we come along and, and um, have been able to be successful with it. And yeah. So sometimes darting them, sometimes we've just netted them. Yeah. You know, if, they're, if they're small enough. 
Right. And I'll debate that it's not that there's too many. It's just that there's so many of us and we've made all the roads in the way of getting that where they want to go yeah. um, or need to go. So, I mean, I get what you're saying. And I'm so proud that California doesn't do hunts. Um, but we're, we're figuring out ways together how to make room for everybody. Well, what about these guys? Um, I'm not sure you were involved with them, no. but your department does really help with bears. Um, and these were three. Um, do you know the story of our three? I don't. I don't know this. Well, story. I'll just go ahead and tell you because this has been, um, you know, a situation that happens around with bears in California. Um, and that's that, you know, when people allow um, bears to get into their garbage and get into their lunches, get into their house, and they become habituated to this food, um, it becomes, it can become deadly for, mostly for the bears. So this was a mom who had taught her cubs, you know, her three cubs, how to do this because yeah. that's how she was surviving. Um, and they all became nuisance. Um, they all became habituated and to a point where the mom was even, you know, had been into a slight altercation that didn't end in any major injury. Um, so the Oakland Zoo ended up taking all three and it was because the department allowed us and trusted us that rather than put them down, um, we could provide a home for them that was wonderful for them and can also help educate people on, on their behavior if they live near bear country. Well, you guys have pulled through 100%. There's no doubt about it. There's no reason not to trust you, especially at this point. Um, and then I might as well show off right now because it was Alaska's Department of Vision and Wildlife. I'm not sure what they call themselves. Um, that brought us um, our four grizzlies when they were cubs. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Same thing. Yep. They were getting into a little bit of trouble even just by entering um, a populated town in Alaska because mm. they're a little dangerous. Mm. And where, you know, there's a surplus now, um, they're not, you know, there's no homes they can go to and there's not tons of zoos. So we were allowed to take our four grizzly, very big boys now. Oh, <laughs> but they are. And it's working with agencies like yours that gets us to do that. Um, okay, so another question, you know, California does have really strict laws around what pets mm -hmm. one can have. Yeah. So how often do you go in because someone's you know someone's noticed somebody has a very odd pet that they shouldn't have it still happens pretty frequently mm -hmm. um you know monkeys ocelots big big ones like tigers lions and tigers that doesn't happen too much anymore do i have time to tell a quick story about us go ahead I, I wasn't there but this was a number of years ago a warden was told that this woman in los angeles had a pet lion a full-size african lion and um, so the warden goes and knocks on her door. I hear you have a, a lion. She says, yes, we moved from wherever and we brought it with us. We don't know what, what, what else we can do. So they go out to the backyard. He's looking at this lion and he, you know, he's thinking, what in the world am I going to do with this lion? We don't, you know, this isn't something we deal with all the time. The lion was lay, laying down. He could see it had a chain around its neck and that the chain was attached to a tree, right? So as he's looking there thinking about this, she goes back inside. The lion stands up and had been laying on the coiled chain. And suddenly the warden realizes that he's within reach of that lion. And that lion comes towards him and he turns to run and that lion pins him down. Jesus. Fortunately, the lion just starts licking him. The woman comes out and says, you know, get, get the lion off. Oh, he's just playing, whatever. But that had to have been absolutely terrifying. Oh my goodness. You know, that, that feeling of, it, it, it's like if you're looking at this mad pit bull, well, of course the lion was just laying there, but, you're looking at this pit bull in a yard and suddenly you realize there's a hole in the fence. And you're like, oh geez, now I'm in it. So. Yeah, so we just, just I know this again wasn't you bringing in this one, but you know, it's because of your colleagues that we got these wallabies and they yeah. were somebody's pet. Um, and luckily some people, you know, can change their mind about a certain pet decision and surrender, um, yeah. but it helps to have your officers influence that surrender so our wallabies were pets as well so i did think it'd be cool if you like walked us quickly through we're going to go back to mountain lions for a minute um yep. how do you like when someone who calls you about that mountain lion and if it is a young one like what is the path to that mountain lion ending up with oakland zoo 
So generally what happens is these mountain lions come somewhere into population and someone calls. Depending on what city they're in, they, they just have a different mindset of who to call. Some call the sheriff, some call the local police department, some will call animal care and control. And every now and then they'll call us directly. For some reason, we, we're always kind of on the back burner. We don't deal with people a lot that aren't fishing and hunting. So if you're not a hunter and fisherman, you just don't think about fish and wildlife. You call your local PD, which is fine. And um, then, they, especially around here, now they know. Mount Lion call Department of Fish and Wildlife. So they will call us and then we will send someone to confirm. And that could be a biologist or it could be a warden. It, d it depends. And it depends on what the mountain lion's doing. If, if it's seen on some rural trail, that's not a big issue. If it's in the middle of Pacifica, you know, well, we should go have a look. And so then once that, once they're seen and it's seen what's going on, then they'll call in help, you know, or, you know, it, it, what, what will happen a lot is say, we'll just use Pacifica again, Pacifica PD or San Mateo Sheriff will say it's up in a tree. They'll stay on scene, keeping their eyes on it until we get there. And more often than not, they'll, they'll stay with us because they know that we're going to try something and that we're probably going to ask for them to stay anyway. So they may have three guys on, one guy goes back on patrol, the other two stay with us. And um, then the, the determination is made can we get it back into its natural area if it's close by just on the other side of the fence that's what we always try first get them back to where they belong they haven't hurt anybody they haven't been aggressive just get them back where they need to go if that doesn't work or they're in a place where like the one at the ballpark where there just is no place to send them then we have to make the decision on whether we're going to dart them or whether we're going to try to net them and that decision is almost always based on how how big they are the biggest one that I've been on that was netted was 70 pounds. And, and, and they're really strong. You know, I, I don't think people realize even a small one, how strong those things are. So once it's darted or it's captured and it's put into the cage, then by this time, someone's already called Oakland Zoo because you guys need to be ready, have your personnel, you know, prepared. And so, okay, we're taking it to Oakland Zoo. And then we go through the whole process of getting it. Sometimes that's really quick. Sometimes it takes a long time, and I know you guys are waiting. And then, uh, then we just drive it straight there. And then uh, usually the warden who goes will stay and collect information as your veterinarian starts saying, "Okay, it's you know 112 pounds. It's a male. It's got uh, um, injuries. It's starving. It's dehydrated. Anything like that." And then we'll take that all down. And then once that's done. And the vet's done with it, and you guys are ready to put it up for the night, then that's usually when we go. All right. Um, well, the, the collaboration's fantastic. And mm -hmm. just go team. I love it. We, we all just love and appreciate it so much. We um, do. Okay, well, we're going to part. But before we part, I'm going to ask you the question. Like, we're all here. Whoever's watching right now, whether they're randomly doing it or plans on doing it, they do want to help. And mm -hmm. we want to know, like, what are what's the average? You had given me these hints before, but mm -hmm. can you share? What can an average citizen do? So I, I've told people this throughout my career. I would rather you call and I have to go somewhere to look rather than, not, rather than think, oh, it's not a big deal and not call and have it be something that we really should have been involved in because it, just, it can just get worse. Um, you, you, you know, people all the time. So you're not allowed to take, Dungeness crab at any time in the bay, San Francisco or San Pablo, right? So, but you can take other crabs and there's signs up, no taking of Dungeness crab. People will call all the time. There's folks on such and such a pier and they're taking crabs. And I know that I'm going to go down there and it's probably going to be legal crab. But you know what? Sometimes you show up and you catch somebody with like 250 Dungeness crab and you're like, thank you for calling. Yeah. And so I, I just tell people, you know, a lot of people, they want to know what happened after they call. Can you call me back and let me know what happened? And I'll usually try to call them back and let them know. And more often than not, it's like, well, that, that wasn't really against the law or it wasn't what you thought it was, whatever. And they'll feel a little embarrassed. And I always tell them, don't be embarrassed. You saw something. You didn't know if it was illegal or not. And you called us to find out. That's all you did. And yes. we went and we found out it wasn't illegal and we're all good. But you know what? Other times, like the one with the, the, the guys on their hunting trip or... There was a, you know, another one involving a crocodile. And just, I mean, the stories could just go on and on. These come from people calling. 
this guy is doing this weird thing. He's got all these animals, you know. Hey, I got a line on a guy bringing a tiger in from Germany. It's in his, it's in yeah. his, uh, um, his uh, uh, suitcase. We had a guy. They call, that was U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Usually, anything coming into the country goes to them. But I work with them all the time. And so here's all of a sudden this drugged, you know, tiger cub in this in this baggage, and that came from someone calling and saying, "I know." So if you, you know, see something, say something. We're recruiting all of you to be to be on the department's team. So yeah. Can, weird. Please do say something. And the other question was um, just so remarkable because it's exactly what we wanted to kind of talk about, and that's how do we get people to not feed animals that are wild? And mm. maybe you can explain why, and then you can hint. I've, I really can't say anything that hasn't been said before. When you start feeding wildlife, they get used to humans. When they get used to humans, they get in trouble. Mm -hmm. There's a, a situation at a lake somewhere here in the Bay Area, I'm not naming names, where people were feeding raccoons and until the young raccoons had never been nocturnal. They had no idea how to take care of themselves. And there was too many raccoons for that area. And it, it, it's dangerous, you know? I mean, if you stop feeding them, they look to humans for food and they see some little two-year-old eating an ice cream cone and, and one of them starts reaching out its little paws for the cone and that little kid, it, it, it's happened. Yeah. And so it's just, it's, I know what people are doing and it's, it's nice to feel like you're doing something with nature. Take a picture, mm -hmm. something like that, get involved with an organization that rescues animals. Don't start feeding animals. They, they will stop being wild and more often than not, they wound up having to be put down. So we really need to say, like, I know you're trying to make a connection, but it yeah. really actually hurts them. Find your connection oh. another way because you, yeah. you are actually doing them more damage. Yeah. And I guess I would say to anybody who's wondering if they should say something to somebody, if you feel safe saying it, right. just say yeah. it. Even if they get mad or don't listen to right. you that time, they'll maybe be thoughtful about yeah. it. You will see, you'll see footage on, like, YouTube of it, fire scenes, people giving water to animals. That's a, a much different situation yeah. than just trying to get them to come to your house so you can see them when you're having coffee in the morning, exactly. which is generally what people are doing. All right. So the water is okay during fire season. When an animal's in distress, yeah. you know, it, it, I, I can't say that it's, it's perfectly fine because there are laws in place, yeah. but there's a difference between an animal being in distress and it, like, okay, for instance, if you saw that an animal had wandered out onto a mud flat on the bay and was stuck and you knew you could get it out, would you leave it there to die or would you get it out? You know, oh, yeah. Leave that to your, to your conscience. Yeah. yeah. But it's the same with feeding. You know, if an animal's perfectly healthy, you've got no business feeding it. Enjoy it, look at it. It's nice, take a picture, tell your friends, put it on social media. Put it on one of those apps where there's so many community science apps that you can that you can get involved in. absolutely and sure, if, yeah fire right now but thank you for saying that thank you for all we do do you have your cocktail ready because we're about to learn how to make the i've been i've been i've been uh imbibing the whole tonic um me too and um this one's homegrown um and filmed right from oakland zoo on the deck of our newly rescued tigers so <laughs> hang in there for a little bit of tiger tonic all right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Cocktails and Conservation at Oakland Zoo. My name is Stacy. I am the primary tiger keeper at Oakland Zoo. I also work with lions and camels and several birds. Um, today, we're going to be making a tiger tonic. Ready for the drink? All right. So, a tiger tonic has one ounce of fancy whiskey. Some of it for the table, <laughs> which is how I used to bartend. Absolutely. When I used to bartend, I always spilled on the counter. Some tonic, a dash of bitters, a 
little stir. Nice, fancy, big cube. It's been a long time since I did a lemon twist. Little twist. And that's our Tiger Tonic. Thank you everybody for uh, joining us today. Please help us celebrate our centennial, our 100 years of being open at Oakland Zoo by never taking pictures with cubs and remembering what we can do for conservation. Well, I've got my drink and I just wanna say cheers. chug -a -lug. First, cheers to our amazing guests, our two guests today, both incredible people, incredible animal advocates, and, and cheers to Stacy, Stacy and her team, the one who, you know, did our wonderful drink video. You know, it's thanks to her, those keepers, those professional staff who take care of our rescues um, that makes it possible to do the rescues. So thanks, Stacy. Oh, yeah. So I have to say, when I started to the zoo 20 years ago, one of the very first things they had me do in the after hours with a bunch of other cool staff was go to the circus that was coming through Oakland and stand outside and leaflet and really teach people why um, we don't really stand for circuses. We don't stand for forcing animals to perform and trying to change some minds and hearts in some really gentle ways. I'm so proud that the Oakland Zoo took on this role and that they partnered and worked with at animal advocacy groups to do this. It made me really feel like I am in the right place. And our next guest is going to totally relate to that. So PETA, why do we support them? Because there's places we totally align. So when you share a similar vision, and the vision could be ending exotic animal performances, it could be promoting the humane treatment of captive animals, it could be penalties for those that exploit and hurt animals, it could be um, creating new laws and policies to change the way we interact with animals. It could be just awareness about the intelligence and sentience of these animals. When you align like that, you have an ally. And we have an ally in PETA. And our special guest. Yay! Um, all right, guys. You saw the Lion King, I mean, the Tiger King, right? Um, because it was COVID and we had to watch something. Um, if you have, you may have met Brittany Peet. Um, she testified in that trial that got Joe Exotic convicted of wildlife trafficking and abuse. Um, and I love, I didn't see Tiger King too, but I love the trailer where a very poised Brittany says, these people are going down. Yes, they are. <laughs> so excited to hear more about that. And welcome Brittany Peet. She is the Deputy General Counsel for Captive Animal Law Enforcement for PETA. So here we are welcoming Brittany. Hi, Amy, glad to be here. Welcome, Brittany. Oops, we are so glad to have you here. How are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you so much. I'm very glad to be here. Well, one thing I have to do because it's tradition in our world, Brittany, when you're from Michigan and you live in Michigan, you got to go, wait, where are you right now? I am right here. Right just in about, the Just about there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. About yeah. There. All right. Yeah. I'm from just about over here. Oh, beautiful area. Okay. <laughs> well, I want to start just by saying thank you and on behalf of the Oakland Zoo and um, all of our community. We absolutely love that we get to work with you. And what you do, and we'll all find out about that, is just so amazing. And, you know, it's so behind the scenes in many ways. So I'm glad that um, these TV shows and other things have brought you forward. And it's been fun to listen to all your other interviews before I did this one and to learn. And now we all get to do that together. So, Brittany, how did you get to be the Deputy General Counsel for Captive Animal Law Enforcement? What was your path to this position? Yeah, so I, I started out as almost an anti-animal advocate. Um, I was in, in college and I was writing my senior sociology paper. Um, sociology was my undergrad major and I was um, a, a very aggressive omnivore, let's say. I thought that being vegetarian or vegan was just stupid. Um, uh, and, you know, with 
without much without much nuance, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, but then I started doing research for this paper, um, which essentially was about you know why, um, you know, being vegetarian in in my opinion at that point was you know sort of anti humanity. Mm -hmm. um, and through that research, I realized I'm not sure how I I missed all of this and you know my my previous couple of decades on the planet, um, you know, I learned how animals um, who are raised for food are, are treated. And around the same time, um, I adopted my first dog, um, a, a beautiful boy named Wesley. And I learned through him that animals have emotions and feelings and personalities. And so I was connecting him to the pigs that I was reading about in this literature, um, and I became vegetarian. So then when I went to law school, um, I took some animal law classes and I really, really loved them. And we had an animal law journal uh, that I was part of. And so I you know, got to my third year of law school and um, kind of panicked realizing, okay, now I'm going to have to be a lawyer. Um, and I'm not sure that I wanna work 80 hours a week for some soul sucking company whose morals I don't support. So what would I want to do? And so I just, I went online and I didn't really know much about PETA at the time. I just, it was one of the animal organizations that I knew and I applied for a job that I wasn't qualified for. Um, but I lucked out, it, it worked out because I got a call um, from PETA's legal department saying, hey, that job you applied for, you're not qualified for that. Um, but we have this new legal fellowship program for new legal graduates who are interested in animal law. Um, so I applied for that fellowship and I was um, part of the first fellowship class and that was 13, almost exactly 13 years ago. Um, wow. So I never well, left. Cheers to applying to things that you don't qualify for just because <laughs> you're interested. Hear that out there. Come on, everyone just go for what you want. Well. How lucky for you and us all and them. Um, and so, okay, here's a hard one. In this role, pick any day. What's something you do in a day or two? Yeah, it's no day um, is is alike in this job, but um, I am lucky enough to, to work with an incredible team um, that includes um, fellow attorneys, um, veterinarians, um, captive wildlife specialists. Those are usually people who have experience, um, you know, as keepers at zoos or, or sanctuaries, previously researchers, um, wonderful administrative assistants. And um, we get complaints from members of the public who have visited captive wildlife facilities, usually roadside zoos and been horrified by conditions. Um, we, uh, I liaise with the litigation team on cases that we're working on. Um, sometimes I'm out in the field um, on, a, on a rescue or testifying in court or um, visiting a, a roadside zoo myself. So that was, that was many days, but those are some of the, some of the things that I, that I do. All right. I like it, it's diverse. And you know, in college, I was in my little, sororities PETA group and we absolutely loved it and did fundraisers and PETA does so much so rather than saying give me an overview of everything PETA does I really like this audience question that we grab and I'm sorry I don't know the name of this smarty but it was just um what is what are a few things PETA does that you are most proud of right now so, I mean, in terms of my focus, which is which is captive wildlife in the United States, um, I'm lucky enough to have a lot of things that I'm that I'm proud of. But um, I think one of the things that I'm most proud of is just the the individuals that that we have helped to to rescue to get from bad situations in roadside zoos or the exotic pet trade mm -hmm. um, or traveling shows into accredited sanctuaries and zoos. I think at this point we're up to um, 76 bears, I think 77 or 78 big cats, 21 chimpanzees, soon to be 22, um, two baboons, 422 chinchillas, um, we've got some kinkajous, kawatis, lemurs in there. 
Um, and uh, so I, I'm so proud that that we have been able to help these animals, some of some of whom, most of whom have been through just horrific abuse and neglect in roadside zoos um, it, to thriving and living much more natural lives um, in sanctuaries and accredited zoos. Well, that, I almost cried. That is something to be <laughs> proud of. I, I love that. And I know how much that takes. It's, it's an incredible amount of work. All right, well, I'm gonna um, share some photos with you and everybody. And I know they all have a story or two that kind of depicts some of this work. So let's kind of go for it. And I just love that when I ask you for pictures, it's just you with this animal, you with that animal. You yeah, with yeah. this animal, you with that animal. So I love it. So what's going on here with this beautiful pup? Oh, so this is a dog named, named Vicky. Um, Vicky is actually a male dog. Uh -huh. um, this photo was taken when I was um, in in India. I was in India at a, a captive bear conference, but I was lucky enough to um, to travel around India with um, the wonderful staffers of um, the PETA affiliate organization, PETA India, um, as well as Animal Rahat. Um, and I was, um, this was actually supposed to be a little tourist excursion. I was going with an animal, or, or I'm sorry, a PETA India staffer um, to tour one of the slums in Mumbai. And we came across this dog who was chained on top of a table with a, a very, very heavy chain, but his water was on the ground and the chain was so taut and so short that he couldn't access the, the water. Um, and the the people who were with him were being very mean and very cruel to him and um, abusive toward him. And so um, so we started talking to them and um, they were uh, speaking, I'm not sure which language exactly, they were speaking in Hindi, I think. Um, so I didn't understand. What I learned later is that one of um, the men who was there with Vicky was threatening to throw us in the river and leave us for dead. Um, but the PETA India staffer um, <laughs> thought very quickly and he, uh, he he lied to the guys and told them that the, the white woman is very important in America. Um, yeah. You'll get in big trouble, you know, if you do anything to hurt us. And we ended up, um, they ended up taking Vicky off that that horrible chain, giving her some water, and um, she was she was barking at us at first, and um, but then you know once she was able to get a drink of water, she calmed down, and she was such a he was such a sweet and affectionate dog, um, and they agreed to surrender the dog to us, um, and he now lives at um, Pita's Animal Rahat Sanctuary in India with rescued bullocks and horses. Uh, oh my and a whole lot of other dogs. I love that. I mean, I love that when you're when you genuinely believe in what you do, you're going to do that thing you do, whether you're on the clock or you just happen to be going to the store. And you're you're one of those people. Thank you for that. It's so nice to imagine Vicky there. This gives us more of a chance to dive into some other topics. But um, you know, it makes me so sad to see this photo. Um, is this, where are you observing this cat? And I'm not sure where this cat is now, but I think you'd be the one to ask this question. It breaks my heart to ask, but what is life like for a captive cat? Um, since we're going to kind of get into all of that. Yeah. So, I mean, just by way of example, I'll just, I'll tell you the story of yeah. this, this lion. Um, her name is Nala. She's a lion tiger hybrid. Um, and this is her uh, on her first day at sanctuary. She's yeah. in quarantine there at the wild animal sanctuary. Um, and earlier that day, we rescued her from Jeff Lowe um, and his roadside zoo, the Greater Winniewood Exotic Animal Park, which was previously owned by Joe Exotic. Mm -hmm. um, and Nala's story um, is kind of a, it kind of brings in um, three of the horrible Tiger King villains. Um, Joe Exotic, who previously owned that property, Jeff Lowe, who had Nala when we rescued her, um, and Tim Stark, the owner of, of Wildlife in Need, um, 
who uh, in violation of multiple multiple court orders, and we'll talk about that in a second, um, transferred Nala and her siblings to Jeff Lowe's Roadside Zoo when they were cubs. Um, at Jeff Lowe's Roadside Zoo, I mean, so obviously they were prematurely separated from their mother at Tim Stark's facility um, in the wild. These, well, in the wild, tiger lion hybrids wouldn't exist. So There's that. Um, let's talk about that. But in general, big cats would stay with their mothers um, for up to two years. Um, and these cats would have been taken from their mother basically instantly after they were born. This is incredibly traumatic for both the cub and for the mother. You're denying these animals everything that is natural and important to them. And these people do this in order to use these cubs um, in very lucrative cub petting um, or tiger baby playtime, as Mr. Stark called it. Um, so these cats ended up with, with Jeff Lowe. Um, on one USDA inspection, inspectors found Nala um, lying in a mud puddle with flies blanketing her ears. You can Google these, you can Google these photos. They're, they're available um, from fly strike, which is something that happens at facilities, typically with poor sanitation practices. Um, and she wasn't moving. It's the only time that I've ever seen a circumstance where the USDA actually halted a USDA inspection and ordered wow. um, an exhibitor to seek emergency veterinary care for wow. an animal. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, a month or two before we won um, this in an Endangered Species Act lawsuit that we had filed against Tim Stark and his roadside zoo, Wildlife in Need. Um, and our legal theory, um, we filed this case under the Federal Endangered Species I mean, Act. It's so brilliant. I, I'm so excited <laughs> you're going to share this. Um, and so... Under the Federal Endangered Species Act, tigers and lions are um, are protected. They're federally protected, and that includes captive members of the species. Of course, we don't have wild tigers and lions in the United States. Um, and so we filed a lawsuit alleging that the this practice of prematurely separating big cats from their mothers at birth violates the Endangered Species Act. It constitutes harassment of these animals. Um, and one of the definitions of harassment is, is essentially disrupting normal behavioral patterns. And what could be more disruptive than separating a mother from uh, her, her cub without medical necessity? Um, and that using these cubs in public encounters violates the Endangered Species Act. Um, and we won. The, the judge, we didn't even have to go to trial. The judge found our case to be so strong and the evidence so overwhelming um, that these practices violate the Endangered Species Act. And so we were able to rescue 25 big cats total, um, including Nala and her siblings, um, who Tim Stark had, had illegally transferred to, to Jeff Lowe. There was a court order preventing um, Stark from from sending cats elsewhere, which is something that happens in in these cases. Um, so we, I think, on a Friday, we rescued twenty three big twenty two or twenty three big cats from Indiana at Tim Stark's Roadside Zoo. They went to wonderful accredited sanctuaries, and then on Monday we were in Oklahoma to rescue Nala and her siblings. And when we found her, um, she couldn't take any more than a few steps in any direction. And I think um, that, that you all might include a, a link to the to the video and the notes for, for this so people can uh, yep. see what um, what it looked like when Nala tried to walk. And, and when you see that video, that was footage that I recorded um, just, after, just after we arrived. She could only take a couple of steps and she would fall over. So what happened is that Nala had a condition called, called me metabolic bone disease, um, which is something that is endemic in these cubs who are used for big cat cub petting. Um, essentially, they're not getting the nutrition that they need um, because they're not being allowed to nurse on their mothers. They're instead being bottle fed. Um, and so metabolic bone disease makes the bones of these cats very weak. 
And you can see there, Nala was not a full grown lion. And I think she was, was maybe nine months to a year old at that point. Um, but when she was taken to um, the, the veterinarian, um, x-rays showed that she had multiple fractures in her legs. And this was as a result of metabolic bone disease and she had severe vitamin deficiencies. Um, and at that first veterinary appointment, um, the experts, I think it was the, the University of, of Colorado or Colorado State University, um, they weren't sure if she would survive. Um, but thanks to the incredible veterinary care from um, the staff at the Wild Animal Sanctuary in Colorado, um, Nala has recovered. Um, and today she lives in a huge, expansive multi-acre habitat with, uh, with other rescue lion, well, lion-tiger hybrids. Um, and she will be able to have a, a wonderful life. If she would have stayed at, uh, at Jeff Lowe's Roadside Zoo, she would have died. Um, and so that's the wonderful thing about these lawsuits. We're not only creating legal precedents that change the landscape um, for captive wildlife, across the United States, um, we're also rescuing the victims and closing down these horrible roadside zoos. And so, you know, we sort of have a threefold mission. You know, we want to accomplish all three of these of these goals and um, and the, the litigation that we're pursuing is one of the quickest ways to be able to accomplish them. Oh my God, that makes me so happy. Yes, we are going to post in the comments um, about Nala's story and, and seeing that. And when you watch it, you can just remember where she ended up. Thank you. It's it's amazing. I'm so excited about the use of this use of this act to get this done. It's pretty brilliant. So Tiger King. Um, without getting too much into it, a lot of us are familiar. What we're but not familiar with the with the outcomes. So I know there's been some very positive outcomes you guys have been involved in. Um, what are some, what were a couple of the victories due to all of that? Yeah, I mean, when I said these guys are going down, I wasn't kidding. Um, <laughs> they, they basically all have. Um, so Joe Exotic was the obviously the focus of the first season. Um, he's in prison now um, on, on uh, having been convicted of two counts of murder for hire and multiple counts of wildlife trafficking um, and takes of endangered species for shooting endangered tigers in the head to make room for tigers that he was was boarding. Um, Jeff Lowe, another of the Tiger King villains, um, was taken down um, as a result of both a, a lawsuit filed by the U.S. Department of Justice um, which relied on the precedent that PETA set in that case against Tim Stark and Wildlife in Need. Um, and so as a result of the, the DOJ's lawsuit, um, Jeff Lowe's zoo was shut down. He is never allowed to exhibit animals to the public again, and every animal that he had was confiscated from him. Um, Tim Stark was taken down as a result of, of PETA's lawsuit, um, as well as a lawsuit um, by um, the Indiana Attorney General's office um, that confiscated um, the, the animals at his facility other than big cats. Um, and most recently, um, Doc Antle from Myrtle Beach Safari um, has been charged both uh, at the state level um, on, on charges of, of wildlife trafficking and cruelty to animals. Um, those charges uh, started out or, or stemmed from a PETA complaint to the, the Virginia Attorney General's office. Um, and more recently, Antle was charged with violating the Federal Endangered Species Act, as well as with um, Lacey, Lacey Act charges and with embezzling uh, money. So he's He's in a lot of trouble right now. Um, so, you know, it's it's really incredible. And one of the, the really exciting things that we've seen, I think both as a result of Tiger King, um, but also definitely as a result of, of Joe Exotic's conviction um, and, and of because of PETA's lawsuits, um, it's created this chilling effect. And back five years or so ago, there were more than 20 roadside zoos across the country that were regularly offering big cat cub petting encounters at their facilities. And these are 
encounters where uh, cats can only be used for a few months before they get too big. So there was this huge cycle of cats being shuffled in and out, and it created this huge overpopulation crisis of captive big cats in the United States. Um, so today, there's only one facility left that's regularly doing big cat cub petting, and their days are number two. That's that's one more Tiger King villain, um, Zoological Wildlife Foundation, and Mario Tabrawi. Um, and we're also now on the precipice of actually seeing the Big Cat Public Safety Act pass Congress. It is passed in the House. Um, we're anxiously hoping that the Senate will soon bring it for a vote, and President Biden has already said that he will sign it. Um, if that happens, then big cat cub petting will immediately become a thing of the past because under the Big Cat Public Safety Act, uh, public contact with big cats will become illegal. So very much looking forward to that. And we sure have come a long way in just a few years. Yes. Well, gosh, that's it's so exciting. When we had before COVID, Oakland Zoo had a we had a like a lion day. We talked a lot about the big Cat Public Safety Act in the very beginning and had people sign things and posters and send cards. So we're going to put a link to PETA's um, petition in the comments too, but I guess the what's left to do is if you have a senator that's in one of the states that isn't going to vote, then, then especially you should go ahead and sign that. So there will be information there. And so Absolutely. what will the Big Cat Public Safety Act do if passed? Yeah, so in addition, I mean, also, please call your senators, even if they are supporting and, you know, let them know that, you know, we, we want to see them really push um, for the Senate to bring this up for a vote quickly. Um, so the Big Cat Public Safety Act um, would ban the private ownership of big cats. So you wouldn't have to worry anymore about your neighbor keeping a tiger in their backyard or basement, which happens, unfortunately, much more frequently than, um, than any of us would like to believe. Um, just recently, once again, um, law enforcement found a tiger when they were um, executing a search warrant in, um, in Texas. And unfortunately, this happens all too often. The Big Cat Public Safety Act will make that clearly illegal under federal law. Um, and, and then also um, the Big Cat Public Safety Act would ban public contact with big cats. Um, so big cat cub petting would be over with the stroke of a pen. Oh my gosh. All right. Well, that just, I don't know. I hope anybody who's listening got the goosebumps I got, but how helpful is that? Well, I have to share this photo because it's a little bit of before and after and kind of exemplifies what you're talking about. So who's this? This is Fifi. Um, and Fifi um, was, she was about 30 years old, a little bit over 30 years old, which is geriatric for a bear um, in that first photo. And she was, she was being held along with three other bears in a backyard in Pennsylvania. It was a former roadside zoo. Um, she was used, she was previously used um, in a performing bear show at that roadside zoo. Um, but then the USDA shut it down. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is that the, the USDA and the, the Federal Animal Welfare Act, which regulates um, captive wildlife exhibitions in the United States, it doesn't regulate possession. So if a facility's mm. Animal Welfare Act license is revoked, that doesn't mean that the facility has to get rid of the animals. And so these bears had been languishing in this backyard in Pennsylvania for decades. Um, and so as you can see, when we found Fifi, she was emaciated and she looked more like a wolf yeah. than she did a bear. Um, and she was elderly, and, and so she was she was another that we just weren't sure if she was going to make it, um, especially given her age. Um, she was transported um, also to the Wild Animal Sanctuary in Colorado, um, and a lot of these bears in, in roadside zoos aren't allowed to hibernate. They either aren't allowed to, or their conditions are so poor um, that they physically can't. Another bear that we that we recently um, helped in rescuing a, a bear named Dylan was held at a hunting club, and his cage was right next to the shooting range. Oh my god! Uh, so it wasn't possible for him to be able to sleep because he was constantly subjected to the sound of gunfire. Um, but as you can see, Fifi, with an appropriate diet, space, and the ability to hibernate for the first time, 
um, turned into a beautiful, amazing winter bear. That's a bear. Um, she is no longer with us. We rescued her many years ago. Um, but she, despite being 30 years old when she was rescued, um, she lived several more years thriving at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. Um, thank you for that. Wow. Yes, I love it. All right. Oh, my God. I want to show you 20 more photos and hear 20 more stories. <laughs> but um, I'm going to ask this question. So one of the things that Oakland Zoo, I love the ways that Oakland Zoo and PETA can align. But one of the things we've done lately has been expert witnesses. And we don't get to talk about it too much, but we have um, our staff member, Darren, along with a lot of other staff who take care of elephants, lions, different animals, can serve this role and kind of support whether it's a humane society, shut down a roadside zoo, or PETA. What does that mean? Can you explain? Yeah, that? so mm -hmm. expert witnesses are used in a lot of different ways, um, including in, in litigation. Um, we need experts to be able to mm -hmm. take a look at the conditions and and opine on what they actually mean for the animal. Um, animal behavior experts, animal welfare experts, veterinarians. Um, you know, what What do, what you know, Fifi's conditions, you know, what does that mean for her? What would, what does, what kind of conditions do does a bear expect? Um, what are a bear's natural behaviors or a big cat's? Yeah. Um, so, so in litigation, they're important also um, just when we're when we're submitting complaints to um, to law enforcement or to USDA, um, we're thankful and, and grateful to have our own in-house experts. But sometimes it's helpful to have um, a third-party, more neutral expert um, who can who can take a look at these images um, and share their opinions with with law enforcement. So we're really grateful to be able to work with um, with experts at the Oakland Zoo to, to serve in that role. And frankly, they've taught me a lot. Okay. Um, you know, sometimes I'll send a, a photo or a video to to an expert and they'll say, nope, Brittany, that's that's completely normal. You know, something that I thought was was a concern. And that's something that helps us because because, you know, there's so much to do in this area. We really want to be focusing on um, where the real concerns are. And so that's another really important way that, that experts help us out. Yeah, I love that. And I'm so glad that we're able to do that. Um, so speaking of that, like what are, um, what are other things that we could do or zoo, what are roles Zeus can play? In my fantasy, and I hope it's a reality and it's becoming one, I see all these organizations that love animals, honor animals, respect them, can find the ways to work together and collaborate. So how do you see zoos supporting some of the work you're doing? Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think what we've found through this process of working with AZA affiliated expert witnesses mm -hmm. is that we agree on much more than we disagree on. We do. <laughs> and one of the big things that, that I found is that AZA affiliated experts and, and staff don't know what is going on at roadside zoos in the United States. And and when they do, and when they actually see what's happening at these facilities, they are horrified. Um, and so I think that, you know, step number one is, is please educate yourself. Um, you know, it's so important because there's so much that you have, that you have to offer and that you can do to help these animals um, who may be in your own backyard. Um, acting as, as expert witnesses, whether for PETA or, or some other organization, um, but also a huge role that zoos can play and that, that Oakland Zoo has been an incredible leader um, in is offering sanctuary to animals who are in need of rescue. Um, there are incredible animal sanctuaries across the United States um, accredited by the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries that um, that step up and take in rescued animals. But the reality is, especially with the amazing momentum that we have right now, um, there are so many more rescued animals than there are spaces in sanctuaries. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of species that, um, that sanctuaries in the United States just don't take. That's the reality. They're, you know, reptile species, alligators, you know, we can't place them in sanctuaries. So we really need 
um, and have to rely on AZA accredited facilities to step up and, and help us out. And I think that what um, the AZA accredited zoos um, and it's more and more of them now are seeing when they uh, when they open their doors to rescued animals and when they share the animal stories is um, their their patrons and supporters love it. They love to hear these stories and they love to know um, that they are supporting organizations that um, that are stepping up and helping animals who are who are in need. And it also gives these institutions the opportunity to educate the public. Um, about the captive wildlife crisis in the United States and some of the worst conditions um, for animals in in roadside zoos or, or these practices like cub petting um, and uh, the abuses that occur for animals who are used in traveling shows and circuses, that kind of thing. So there are so many opportunities um, for AZA accredited zoos to get involved. Um, and we're seeing many, many more of them. And Oakland has always been the leader in this area. So we are so grateful um, to you all for, for that. And, and you just keep stepping up um, and it's really awesome. Well, couldn't be more uh, on behalf of everyone who does all that work. <laughs> um, you're so welcome and it is our pleasure. All right, one last question for you, and we are going to talk about those rescued tigers. Um, <laughs> question for you, because we love this question, is what gives you hope right now, today? I mean, the, if you would have asked me five years ago, mm -hmm. um, when, well, in, in, in some cases, some people did ask me, you know, when, when is big cat cub petting going to end? I would have said, you know, maybe 10, 15 years. And now here we are. And we're basically there. You know, we've got one facility left. Nobody else wants to touch it. Um, so, you know, we're doing it. You know, we set goals and we make it happen. And so the amazing progress and victory that we've had with, with Big Cat Cub Petting, which, you know, just a few years ago seemed to be an insurmountable problem, um, it, it gives me incredible hope. And I, I think that that one of the, the big reasons for that is that is that the public is really getting it. And I think, uh, you know, for all the complaints about Tiger King, I think that Tiger King played a role in this oh. in, in educating people, um, you know, you know, as much as it was about those personalities, people did notice and see the abuse of animals that was taking place. And, you know, they realized, oh my God, I didn't realize this was happening. This is not okay. Um, and so, you know, the, the best way and the quickest way to end the abuse of animals in roadside zoos and in these horrible practices, there's also bear cub petting, oh, yeah. um, is for people to just stop buying tickets to these places. Um, you know, so consumers have such a huge role to play in this too, and they're turning their backs on this industry in droves. So that's what's giving me hope. All right. Well... Thank you, Brittany. Cheers to you and all you do and our partnerships and more in the future. And have a lovely night there in Michigan. Yes, you too. Thank you so much. Grateful for all you all do. All right. So let's talk about those tigers. Um, our tiger habitat, like we've shown you a couple of our rescues, it's been a place for rescued tigers for 30 years. In fact, when our beautiful four sisters passed, um, we just held it empty. We didn't want just any tiger. We wanted to make sure we were continuing our legacy of rescues. And then it happened. A concerned Oklahoma citizen um, knew that there was an abandoned, was an abandoned zoo that still had cats. Um, wasn't sure how they were doing, how they were, being, how were, were they being fed. It was definitely a deteriorating condition that this person witnessed. And they said something. So these cats were living in super small cages. Here's a picture. Um, and they were filthy. And we got involved with partners because this is the way forward. Who helped us do this? Bring these tigers and lions somewhere else. So let's see. A coordinated system happened um, to get these cats to a new place. So an 18-year-old arthritic lion went to Turpentine Creek Wildlife Refuge, which is in Arkansas. Um, lions and tigers and bears, a sanctuary in San Diego took a tiger and Oakland Zoo welcomed 
Mia the tiger and Lola, who's a hybrid tiger with this facial infection um, into the zoo. So these sentient, intelligent beings had never had comfort, enrichment, really good food or medical treatment. And now let's show now, um, they're free to roam. <laughs> they're free to roam and roll and breathe fresh air and eat great food, food and jump up on giant ledges and swim if they care to. So we're so proud of the relationships we've had with the organizations I just met um, mentioned and the fact that we once again have these tigers um, for all of you to see and love as well. So please come check them out. So what's next for Oakland Zoo and rescues? Well, we are dedicated. So our vets and our partners and our education staff and our animal care staff, our director, our media department, and even me in conservation, really, really want to focus on on serving an even bigger role in the world of rescues. So stay tuned while we do that. And we really wanna tell you in the comments other ways you can help because there's so many. Well, first of all, you can take our illegal wildlife pledge to make sure your actions you're doing, and we all do them, um, help animals and share that pledge. Um, you can support the Big Cat Public Safety Act um, and we've talked about that a little, and there's a link there for you. Um, you can join our live events that are in September and October. Um, you can check out Oakland Zoo's welfare page, learn more about PETA and the Department of Fish and Wildlife. All right, I wanna thank everybody who's joined us over the past two plus years at Cocktails and Conservation. It's been so much fun to ride out that pandemic and more with you all. And thanks to our guests, Toast to you all, and especially you people who rescue animals with us. Bye-bye.